Hello, hello, fellow winter photographers. Now, if any of you have been watching my videos from the very beginning, you may notice this is a very familiar tree. I did a, a video, uh, uh, it's probably about five or six years ago in Mount Seymour. And uh, this is the same tree that I used in the beginning with the, uh, the raven flying off the top. Uh, so I thought I'd come up here again and uh, try my luck out. It's just gorgeous up here. Uh, the only problem is, is that uh, there's no light. <laughs> it's so flat up here. Uh, it started off really well down in the parking lot. I, uh, it was a little bit cloudy, but didn't look too bad. And then as, as I got higher and higher, just started to get more and more socked in. It's just too bad because it's just, geez, these trees are just fantastic. You'll see that uh, because it's so wet on the west coast here, we get really wet snow. So when it snows up here, it just plasters these trees and uh, just sticks right on them. It's amazing that these branches could hold this much weight. Uh, pretty harsh conditions for these trees to live in, but make fantastic uh, photographs. Right, let's see what I can find up here. I, uh, I'm not terribly optimistic that I'm gonna get anything great, but uh, it's just too good to pass up. Right. Uh, Adam Gibbs is with us, not here in Salt Lake City, but he is online and uh, he will just join us in a minute. But I am so excited. This is the first live event that we've done as the Outsiders in preparation for Canab next March. And gonna be a, an extra special treat getting a little preview of a little bit of what Adam might cover. And uh, I'm just gonna, you know, patch him in right now. Adam, are you there? Hello, hello, hello. Adam Gibbs, I can see ya. I think I'm here. <laughs> you are here. Well, you're not here in Utah. Tell us where you're at. Uh, right now I'm in uh, on Vancouver Island where it's uh, pouring rain. But, you know, it's uh, it sure beats the rest of Canada where it's, you know, deep freeze. So I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, tell us, have you been home uh, long or did you just come in for a, from a trip? What have you been up to? No, I've been hanging around uh, Vancouver Island for the past... Uh, I guess a couple of months. Uh, I don't know. I if if I had it my way, I just stay on the island. I wouldn't go off the island. It's just uh, I really like it here. So yeah, I love it. What's your favorite thing about being on the island? Uh, probably the west coast. Like we we live on the east coast uh, where it's quite populated, but the west coast is quite a bit uh, wilder. So uh, yeah, that's where all the the good photography is for sure. I mean, there's a little bit on the East Coast, but most of it I, I find to be on the on the West Coast. It's quite wild over there. And are you originally from uh, the area? Tell us a little bit about your background and how you got to Vancouver Island. Uh, well, my mum and dad actually live right next door. So uh, that was one of the, the reasons why we with the house came up for sale right next door to them. And uh, it was such a good price. So we, my partner and I, we bought it uh, several years ago and we've been renting it out for a number of years. Uh, but now we've kind of decided to, to fix the place up and, uh, and live here part time anyway. Um, like my partner, she's not ready for retirement, so she has to be on the mainland. So we, we kind of back and forth from Vancouver to Vancouver Island. But I seem to be spending more time over here, and she's spending more time on Vancouver. <laughs> so, I got gotcha. <laughs> well, you. You get around. Where's the next trip besides before you go to Kanab? I'm sure you go. Uh, you're going somewhere fun. Uh, yes. Uh, in a few weeks, I'm on a big trip with uh, Nick Page and Thomas Heaton and Gavin Hardcastle. We've. Uh, well, I won't. I won't go into the, all the details, but we're we're going on a big camping trip. <laughs> and it's, oh wow! Uh, it's uh, it's going to be for three weeks, and uh, we're going to be touring around um, uh, the Pacific Northwest and then down to California. Uh, hopefully, the weather will be half decent for us. <laughs> wow! So I, I assume that it would be uh, definitely weather dependent upon where you're going to stop and what you guys are going to do. I'm excited to see what you guys have in store. It, 
Yeah, most definitely. It's going to be a bit of a, well, hopefully some epic photography and uh, there'll be a bit of vlogging, you know, <laughs> some some comedy, you know, the usual. So, you know, your channel, I've been following you on YouTube and following your, your photography. And I have to say, you kind of came out of your shell with, with some of the vlogging that you have going on with Nick and Gavin, because we see a totally different Adam. Gavin declares <laughs> that it's the true Adam, and yet you tone it down on your on your own station. Tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, who you are and how you got involved with so much and in, in doing the vlogging and and uh, who the real Adam is. Which which version? Uh, I'm probably a, a, a bit of a in between. I uh, I'm actually quite reserved usually. Um, Gavin has this way of getting people to do things that they might not otherwise do, uh, as I'm sure you already know, cause you've met Gavin a couple of times. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I, I have, we have a lot of fun, so I just go with it. You know, there's, there's some things that I kind of cringe a little bit, but then I think, ah, it's, it's all good fun, you know, and we have such a laugh and really, to be honest with you, uh, you know, if you're just serious about photography all the time, all the time, it, it just gets to be a bit of a drag after a while. So I, I don't know. I just like to have a bit of fun with it. And and Gavin's uh, a great guy to be with. Um, and uh, it, it's just great to be able to 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 do two totally different things. Like on his channel, I just goof around and and we have a lot of fun. Um, but at the same time, he he's a good photographer, so he. he you know, he has a lot of uh, educational stuff. And then on my channel, you know, I just, I mean, that's what I like. I, I like to be more involved in the whole process of photography and the outdoors. So I show more of the, uh, I mean, I, I do show quite a bit about photography, but it's more to do with the the area and, and why I'm drawn to that area. And because uh, I think it has a lot to do with, with successful photography anyway. So yeah, it works. It works great for, for me uh, to do both, you know, yeah. Yeah. Well, and we're sure excited for you to come down to Kanab. And have you been to that area before? And if so, what, what stood out about Kanab? And why are you excited to be a part of the outdoors? Kanab. Okay, now Kanab's pretty close to Zion, right? Yes. Yep. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> I don't know the area really well. Uh, Zion National Park, I've been to several times in the past. Uh, but that was before I started uh, up on YouTube. Uh, I mean, the, the desert Southwest is just absolutely fantastic as, as I'm sure many people watching now will, will know. Um, I, I'm looking forward just to coming down and, and spending time with other photographers. Uh, to be honest with you, we're, we're really quite isolated up here. We don't meet a lot of other photographers. I mean, I know Gavin and I've met some of the other photographers, but mostly on, on trips that we've done outside of uh, Vancouver Island. But as far as the island goes, uh, you know, there's there's very few photographers that come up here. And, and in some ways, that's a really good thing because uh, it, it leaves all that good stuff for us. You know, I think I think the photography up here is quite a bit more challenging. It's not so much in your face, dramatic. Uh, it's quite quite a bit more subdued. So that could be why not so many people come up this way. They tend to go more to the desert southwest and, and the states, you know, where there's a lot of dramatic uh, scenery, you know. Well, and you are bringing people to you. You, you have been not only, you know, accomplished as a, a award winner, you know, on the photography front, but you're also doing workshops. Tell us about those. Yeah, uh, the workshops, because uh, there's, there's a real lack of uh, people doing workshops, and I don't want to encourage anybody else to come up here and do them. But, uh, uh, yeah, we've been doing some on the West Coast. The hard part about the West Coast and actually the whole of the island is um, logistically it's it's difficult because there aren't that many places to really stay, especially the areas that I want to go to. Uh, like this this coming uh, spring, uh, Gavin and I have a or in June we have a trip up to San Jose Bay, which is the the northern tip of Vancouver Island, and it's absolutely gorgeous up there, but the, there's nowhere to stay so it's a camping trip and that and that tends to put people off right away uh another area that i'll be taking people is carmana provincial park which is an area that i've i've always wanted to take people into but again 
you know, you're driving 100 kilometers on logging road uh, through logging slash to get to this park. So it's it's not ideal. And then, of course, once you get there, there's there's nowhere to stay. So, again, it's another camping trip and that kind of puts people off. Um, but, you know, if you want to go to these these really great areas or something a little bit different than the normal the normal stuff, then, uh, you know, you have to kind of put up with a few discomforts, I think. Uh, it was kind of the same with Greenland. Uh, I mean, absolutely just fantastic. Uh, but again, it's hard to get to. It's expensive. And, uh, you know, it's a camping trip. Yeah. <laughs> people just don't want to camp. <laughs> well, and I think most people know that you cover quite a territory in your photography. Do you have a specific favorite spot or a spot that you've never been to that you're really aching to get to? Oh, that's a hard one. Uh, there's there's a lot of areas that I would love to go to, uh, especially in northern British Columbia. Uh, but logistically, again, it's it's very difficult to get to these areas. You, you either have to uh, a helicopter in, which is as I mean, is extremely expensive to to rent helicopters. Uh, another option sometimes is that you can rent uh, or, or uh, you, you can rent a, a, a float plane. Um, which is a somewhat cheaper than helicopters, but again, it, you know, you're, you're talking hundreds of dollars just to get to an area. And then of course you got to drive up to these areas as well. So there are a number of areas that I'd love to go to, uh, Mount Aziza provincial park is an area that I've been to once before with my friend, Jeremy, and I, but I'd love to go up there again. It's just absolutely spectacular, but Again, you're once you're in there, you're there's 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 no facilities whatsoever. You're you're pretty much on your own. So, uh, and you know, me not being a guide uh, with limited first aid experience, you know, it's very difficult for me to take people into these areas unless I start hiring proper guides and and so on. You know, because you want to keep people safe. You know, right. um, I mean, when it comes to my own safety, well, that's that's my business. But when you, you know, when you're bringing other people in, you know, it's difficult. Have you been nervous? Have you talking about safety? Is have you come across a, a scary situation as a photographer? And if so, uh, tell us about it. Uh, well, not really. I, I'm pretty. I'm pretty. Um, what's the word? I'm. I'm pretty. I don't know. I don't do anything stupid. I've heard some really stupid stories about photographers. Uh, unfortunately, mostly Instagrammers <laughs> so doing <laughs> doing stupid things. Uh, there's been a number of deaths actually um from uh from from instagrammers trying to get shots that you know they probably shouldn't have gone for uh i don't know i used to do, used to do a lot of rock climbing um but those days are kind of long gone so I, I i tend to you know if if it if it means getting myself into a dangerous position then I, I probably won't go for the shot no no shot is worth it for me to uh you know risk my life life over that's for sure uh, I mean, even even if I'm by the ocean, I, I'll see people out there and they're way out on the rocks there and I'm just waiting for that wave to just to come in and sweep them away. I mean, I've heard some horror stories, uh, well, from friends as well, that being swept out by a rogue wave. It's just not worth it. I mean, for me, it's not anyway. I'm you with know. you on that. Yeah. <laughs> Especially the waves. I go to Kauai often and it's just, you know, people don't know the power of nature or they think that something's going to be predictable and they don't. And it's, uh, it's unfortunate, but, uh, on a positive note, looking forward <laughs> to Canab, I've got a question here from buddy price. He says, Hey Adam, I've ordered your book. Will you be available to sign it at the conference in Canab? Yes, definitely. Um, yes. Sorry for the, for the people that bought my book. Unfortunately, the, the, the books were being published in the UK and, you know, logistically it's, it wasn't worth me flying all the way to the UK to sign books. I know people were a little bit disappointed about that, but, uh, but yes, if you, if you bring the book, I'll definitely sign it for you. Yes. I'm sure he'll be happy about that. Another question besides award winning images, what other benefits do you love about being out in these landscapes above and beyond photography? I, I'm assuming is what they're asking. Well, that, I mean, that's what it's all about for me. Uh, uh, the photography part of it uh, is is really secondary. I, I mean, it really is. Uh, it's just a good excuse to go out into into the wilds. Uh, like I said, I, I used to rock climb. I mean, that was an excuse to be outside. Uh, trail run, uh, 
that was another excuse. I mean, all of these things that we do in the outdoors are really excuses just to get outside. Now, obviously, I, I make my living from photography, so I do have to take it a little bit seriously. Otherwise, <laughs> you know, I, I'm not going to be able to make a living. But the bottom line is, is that the nature and my experience outside comes before the photography. Uh, that's that's pretty much it. And it always has done. Yeah, I, I apologize for cutting you off. On top of that, tell us about becoming the 2018 International Landscape Photographer, uh, Photographer of the Year. What was kind of the process and, uh, you know, were, what was your reaction when you won? Well, it was, uh, it was a huge uh, surprise, that's for sure. Um, I, actually, I entered the year before and I came second. And uh, I, I mean, I was just blown away by that. So then when I entered again, I thought, well, there's no way I'm going to place anywhere. And then when I found out I actually won, won the thing, I was just blown away because my t photography tends to be more uh, traditional than like a lot of photography now is uh, more, there's a lot more processing that, that's involved. And, and people that win these, these contests tend to have a lot more processing in their images. Uh, and one of my images did have quite a bit of processing, but generally speaking, most of my photography is more to do with actually, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's more traditional, like like with using a, with film and, and such. So I was I was really uh, surprised that I that I came away with first prize for sure. Um, I mean, it was a great surprise. It really was. Uh, we're judging the images now for 2019, and man, it is a huge process. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not fun. <laughs> well, you know, we're sure appreciative of you, you know, sharing your talents and your expertise in Canab. One of the things that, you know, we ask not only the speakers, well, not, not only the audience and the attendees, but we ask the speakers what they wanted to speak on in Canab. You had mentioned visual storytelling and composition. Tell us more about why you may have chosen that to speak on in Canab. Well, my my background is more. I'm I'm more interested in the actual art of taking photographs over, say, the equipment. Um, you know, even if you go on YouTube, uh, a lot. The majority of videos are technical, technically oriented. I think there's a a huge lack in uh, videos on composition, light, and really at the end of the day, I, for me, that's the most important part. That the gear itself, yes, it's important, but really, I mean, you you can take great shots with with any camera. You can take great shots with a cell phone. I think I think what's really important to me is just trying to direct people's uh, uh, vision more towards the actual process of of making images over say the technical aspect so that i mean that's what interests me i mean when it comes to talking about gear i mean really i'm, I'm pretty useless uh i have you know i'm, I'm using the nikon d850 and i am also using a, a fuji gfx and uh half the stuff on there i don't even know how to use I, I haven't even read the manuals i just kind of turn it on and start using it and then all of a sudden i think well god how the hell do i do that and, and then you're fiddling it around you know, trying to, so I'm not a great person to uh, approach when it comes to, well, how do I do this on my camera? Because I, I probably wouldn't know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, when it comes to light and uh, composition, those are the things that I'm really interested in. So I, I think I, I have a pretty good knowledge about them anyway. So that's why I chose them for the Canab thing. Well, we're excited to have you down there. Picture Line, where I am currently, is actually one of our largest uh, contributors and sponsors. And so they've been gracious to have us uh, be able to come in store to kind of, kind of show a nice background. And uh, they'll be on site. So for the technical side in Canab, we're excited to be offering so many manufacturers there that can walk people through all of the gear and the tech and the gadgets. Because I, like you, I, I kind of fumbled my way into photography and uh you know, don't know all the technical aspects, but uh, every time I learn something new, it's, uh, you know, pretty exciting. Tell us, as you evolve, you know, do you ever find yourself being, you know, okay, I've got this, or do you find yourself learning things over and over? And if so, what's the latest thing that you've learned that you've incorporated uh, into your photography? Oh, geez, that's a difficult one. Um, yeah, I don't know about that. Uh, Maybe I'd have to think. <laughs> Pardon? 
Maybe right? the GFX. <laughs> Is that well, a pretty G- technical camera? No, it's not actually, uh, and that's why I, I'm I actually really like it. Uh, a lot of the Fuji cameras that are coming out, uh, they they, it's funny they're they're digital cameras, but they're kind of designed or they look like old film cameras, and I kind of like that. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, I, I mean, I, I, when I first started photography, I was using mostly large format, uh, four by five cameras, which is every, everything is manual. And then, of course, the, 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 um, the SLRs back then were all manual. The very first one I had, like the aperture ring was on the lens. Uh, the shutter dial was different and, and so on. And the GFX and some of the newer cameras uh they're actually designed kind of similar, but they're but they're obviously they're they're digital digital cameras, and if you want to bypass those functions, you can. But I kind of like the old style design. I, I really do. Uh, um, but as far as learning the new stuff, um, most of it's to do with processing. I, I'm I tend to stick with the same uh, processing skills over and over again. But I know that there's easier and better ways to do it, but I tend to keep doing it the old ways because that's what I'm used to. And, and then someone will show you a different way, and it's way easier, way quicker. You know, oh, okay, well, maybe I'll start doing it that way. Do you know, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, but I, I tend to try to stick to – I try to keep things relatively simple. Uh, otherwise, you just get bogged down with technicalities. Plus, I'm getting older, right? So I – you know, it's getting hard to learn new stuff. <laughs> yeah, I, I appreciate that. And you had a phenomenal year. I recently watched your uh, most recent YouTube video on your 2019 favorites. I'm going to pull those favorites up now. And uh, I know you probably don't see them on your screen, Adam, but I've got that uh, JPEG with, you know, nine different images on it. Maybe you can yeah. walk us through a couple of them. Tell us uh, your thoughts on why they're your favorites and uh, anything else about them well probably the one that stands out the most and it tends to be one of uh, one image that stands out for a lot of people is the one of the uh, aspen tree in uh, the canadian rockies uh i don't know i don't know why i like it so much uh, i guess because it's quite simple and it has a nice color palette to it but uh i, I guess what was neat for me is that you know, we go to these areas with these expectations of what we want to photograph. In this case, it was Abraham Lake. Uh, and if anybody's been to Abraham Lake, they'll know that if you go there in the winter and you get the right conditions, you get these, you get these great uh, bubbles forming on the lake, and then you get the mountains in the background. Uh, but I try to keep an open mind because a lot of the times you go to these areas and the conditions just won't be that great and that was kind of the case with this image uh, the conditions for the lake were, were awful so I decided to go and look for something else and I, I ended up just photographing a, a single tree with a, a number of trees in the background and I just I for whatever reason it just turned out uh it's just very shallow depth of field, but enough that you can still see the trees in the background. It just has a nice feeling to it. Another one that kind of stands out, this is more because it was just unusual. This was on the same trip, uh, was uh, some of some icicles, uh, Hafner Creek. And uh, it was just neat because the, they were these stalagmites that, that were just, they were massive. They were two, two meters high, some of them. And I'd never seen anything like it. It was just so cool to see this thing. So there's a there's a cave, and I guess what happens is there's moisture that comes off of the creek and forms. Uh, the moisture goes up into this cave, and then of course, in the cave, it's a little bit warmer. So as the the moisture melts, it just keeps dripping down and then forming these big icicles that keep forming on the ground and just keep going, getting bigger and bigger. And it's just I don't know. It's just really cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Looks like you uh, spent some good time in the desert. On the bottom right, and and maybe I don't recognize that one per se, uh, with the trees out in the desert. It's kind of oh uh, yeah, yes, uh, the Gobi talking. Desert. Uh, last year, I uh, I went to the Gobi Desert. I'm going again in February. Um, it was it was funny because China, like I said in the video, uh, China has never really been a place that I I'd really wanted to visit. Uh, not for any particular reason. I just never really had much desire to go there. Uh, 
but I saw a, a video from a friend of mine, uh, Alex, uh, uh, Alistair Ben, who's, a, who's also a photographer. And uh, I just thought, man, that is just incredible. So we decided, my partner and I decided to go on a trip with Alistair and Juan Lee and uh, just thought it was just, in, just incredible. It's kind of like um, Death Valley, the dunes there, except more of them and much bigger and, and no people. So uh, it was just a fantastic trip. And uh, this year I'm going again with Juan Lee. We're doing a workshop there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just an incredible experience. So uh, that's, I, I had a number of images from uh, the Gobi Desert. It's just, uh, just an amazing place, you know. How long were you out there for? Um, I think in total, maybe, uh, I'm trying to remember now, five or six days. Oh, wow. Yeah, you're camped out and it's pretty cold too. It, uh, it goes down, it can go down to minus 20, uh, but it's a dry cold. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty cold place in the winter it gets extremely cold. Oh. And yeah. you camped and you camped out, you know. But in, well, of course in the summer it's just too hot to go there. It's scorching hot, so How hot are we talking? Uh um uh, I have no idea actually. Um I'm I'm guessing in the 40s, 40s Celsius, you know, range. Um probably 100 degrees Fahrenheit, I'm just guessing here. Unreal. Kind of like Death Valley, I guess. Yeah. It's pretty hot there. <laughs> well, uh, one more question that we'll take from the audience. On average, how long do you take to find your compositions? Oh, God. Uh, really depends. Um, some play, sometimes, you know, you just walk up to an area and it will just hit you in the face. And then other times... Uh, Especially if you're not really in the in the mood to take photographs, it takes a bit longer. I find that uh, whenever I go to the the, the forests, it, it usually takes me quite a bit longer because it's just a huge mess, you know. And it's 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 difficult to try and find uh, something out of all that chaos. If there's a little bit of light, uh, that that really does help because then I'm drawn to light, and that kind of uh, draws me into what kind of composition I might end up taking in the long run, I guess. But uh, I don't know. There's no real set number. You know, sometimes it takes a long time. Other times, not very long at all. It's a great question. Dana asks, are you influenced by any photographer? There's uh, most of the photographers that I uh, grew or when I started. I um, So I guess mostly past photographers. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of photographers that I, I still follow, but some of them are hard to find online because they're just not into social media. <laughs> you know, like uh, there was a, a photographer in particular that I really loved uh, when I first started, and that was Pat O'Hara. He's from the uh, Pacific Northwest. Uh, Jack Dykinger from uh, the uh, the Arizona area. Um, Charlie Kramer, who's still active taking photographs. Uh, John Sexton, uh, black and white photographer. Uh, more recently, Hans Strand. Uh, I really love his photography. Uh, who else is there? Um, God, there's Carl Clifton. Most of these guys are older guys, you know. Um, more recently, uh, who else is there? Uh, I'm just trying to think now. You, you kind of put me on the spot. <laughs> uh, Theo, wow. Theo, Theo Buzzbomb. I really, really enjoy his photography. And uh, there's a new photographer. Um, oh, of course, I'm not going to be able to remember his name now. <laughs> um, yeah, I can't remember his name. There's, I mean, there's so many great photographers out there, you know. Uh, but I, I don't know. I, I tend to be drawn to the, the people that do it more traditional type photography. I guess it's just the age group that I'm at. Uh, the The... the the, the processing and the overprocessed stuff, I'm not, it's not really my thing. I mean, I can see the attraction to it, but it's, it's not really my, my shtick. Um, but, you know, um, everybody is into different things, I guess. You know, Greg West, thanks, Adam. Do you go to a location with a particular image in mind that you want to shoot? Uh, very rarely. 
uh, because I'm usually disappointed. <laughs> uh, I tend to, uh, I used to, but not so much anymore. I, um, I, I generally try to go in an area with, without any kind of expectations. Um, an actual fact that some areas like Greenland, uh, the Gobi Desert, except for the video that I saw, I, I didn't even look into the area at all. I didn't know what to expect. Uh, just went in there with a blank mind, more or less, which I'm pretty good at, and uh, and just go from there, you know. I think sometimes it's probably not a bad idea to uh, pre-plan a few shots ahead of time, uh, but I, I don't tend to do that. It's, it could be out of laziness, um, but I think I, I just so I don't get any preconceived ideas of, of what I'm going after and then I'm not disappointed, you know. Right. I hope that answers the question. Absolutely. Well, Adam, thank you so much for joining us today. On the screen is information about the upcoming conference of which you'll be at speaking uh, with quite a few of your friends and our friends. It is sold out. However, we're planning these every year. So in case anybody wants for future planning, Go on outsidersphoto.com, click the, it doesn't say register now, but join the wait list and that will add you to our wait list if you'd like to be potentially going to next year in case anybody drops out or we'll add you to the mailing list for the following years. And I'm just going to pull up some of the speakers who will join us. And Adam, you probably know several of these uh, photographers, but we've got Alex Noriega, Dan Ballard, Josh Cripps, Kevin McNeil, Nick Page, David Danette, Eric Bennett, Jennifer Renwick, Nikki Freights, Sarah Marino, Suzanne Mathia, Michael Shanebloom, and then the organizers are myself, David Swindler, Dustin Lefevre, Phil Monson, and our keynote is Art Wolf. So we're we're really excited for such a uh, fantastic lineup, and you know excited to see you there, Adam. So. Any last words of wisdom to either attendees or anybody starting out in photography as a last uh, uh, word of advice? Uh, follow the light. <laughs> follow the light. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Perfect. That's good. Yeah, follow the light. All right. Thanks. Appreciate it. So uh, if you enjoy this video, make sure you give me a thumbs up and uh, I'll catch you next time. All right. Thank you.